probably about the 50th person to welcome here this morning, but welcome again on the fourth Sunday, fourth Sunday of Advent. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, if you look in your bulletin, you'll notice that it says that the worship service is tonight, it's the candlelight service, and the seven o'clock service, that's not true. That's tomorrow night on Christmas Eve. Service will be actually on Christmas Eve, not on the 23rd. Um, we had a community dinner here, I think, believe it was on last Wednesday. And I, uh, the organizers would like me to thank everyone that volunteered and came down and helped. I believe we did 160 some mass dinners, Priscilla. How many dinners we do on Wednesday? Uh, about 160. It is really a, it's a very fun evening for those of you that be there, that haven't come down. It's, it's a very enjoyable evening. Just come down and hang out and get a free meal, sort of, kind of. Uh, I believe Pastor Wade has a couple announcements and we'll get this thing going. All right, good morning. By my count, there are only 88 more days until spring. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, Monday, 10 a.m., uh, if you've signed up to, uh, to help set up luminaries, just a reminder that that's when we will do that. And this announcement comes from Christ United Methodist Church. Pending a spectrum repair and no technical difficulties, the 2018 Cantata, Come and See, Go and Tell, will be aired continually on Christmas Day on Spectrum Channel 1024. So if you, if you missed it or you want to see it again, it will be aired, should be aired, on Christmas Day on Spectrum Channel 1024. It can also be found on Christ United Methodist Church's YouTube page. So if you're interested, you can also find it there. Thank you. One more thing before we go here. Uh, observation more than announcement. It is just so nice to see so many faces in here this morning. It is very heartwarming to me. Thank you very much for showing up today. Be nice to have you all here every Sunday. I guess that's all the announcements. If we take a couple quick seconds here just to go and say hi to folks, we'll try to get this thing going. We've got a full house today, a full program, so let's try to keep it quick. Good job, folks. I'm sorry I'm coming across too loud here this morning. I'm a little excited. If we could just now join in the call to worship. No. Not yet. No? Not, yet. Not yet. We're going to light the last candle. Okay. <laughs> I'm moving right along. There we go. Today is the fourth Sunday in Advent. 
we have, up till now, we have lit and lighted the first three candles, and today we light the fourth candle. These are the words of Mary, the mother of Jesus. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in their thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their throne and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with many good things and sent the rich away empty. These familiar words were spoken by Mary upon greeting Elizabeth. Imagine the joy of this meeting when they can discuss their own and each other's pregnancy together for the very first time. And what did they talk about? Is it gonna be a boy? Is it a girl? Baby clothes, new furniture? No, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. I declare the greatness of God and my spirit rejoices. Mary, a young woman, a teenager, not so long before, now pregnant and unmarried, declares the greatness of God and recognizes the unique calling she has received. As with so many other mothers before and after her, she does not know what joy or sorrow may follow the birth, but she is ready to rejoice in God, her Savior. It is for Mary that we light this fourth candle. Mary, blessed among women, Mary, the Lord's lowly servant, Mary, who believed that God was about to fulfill the promise made to Abraham so long ago. And if you will join me in this response, come, Lord Jesus. Now, if you would all join me in the call to worship. Can you feel something powerful at work in the world? We can catch glimpses here and there. We need to look beyond the hustle and bustle of Christmas to see what's coming. Come, let us prepare ourselves in this time of worship that we may be ready when our world is turned upside down. If we can now please, if able, stand and join in the opening hymn.
opening prayer. In breaking God, as Christmas draws near, it's hard for us to settle down. It's difficult for us to focus on your word. Come to us this morning and shock us out of our Christmas complacency. Open us to the transforming love of the one whom we are waiting. Grant us the faithfulness of Mary and Elizabeth that we may respond with the full-throated yes to all that is coming. We come this morning in expectation, in joy, in more than a bit of fear for what all of this will mean for us. But here we are here, God. Give us eyes to hear, hearts to receive, shown in grace. Amen. Please have a seat. Enjoy the music of our temple choir. Uh, Robin's up here. Where did Robin go? She's hiding someplace in there. Front pew for just a minute. I want to talk to you about something exciting. What have we been studying? Ethan, the books of the Bible. Well, I met someone, and her name is Jenny Ha. She goes to church here. Jenny, would you raise your hand so the kids can see where you're at? See Jenny back there? Jenny, go ahead and have a seat. Jenny had to learn the books of the Bible when she was your age. So she learned the books of the Bible, and then she came down front, and she had to recite them in front of the whole church. And then she got this. Isn't that pretty cool? Something from when she was a little girl. You can look at it, be very careful. Look at it real quick, pass it along, and then we're going to start our program, okay? Okay, go pass it to the next one. Yep, she's fine. She's fine. Okay, let's show it to Ethan real quick, and then... 
So that's pretty cool, right? And now that she is not your age anymore, she has the word of God in her heart. So she can carry it with her, right? Okay, let's join me down front here. Okay, stay out here. Sit there, you can sit on my lap. You can sit on my lap. Okay. You can call her Mumu or Madison. Okay, I need to sit down because I am exhausted. Can you guys come around the side, Ethan and Megan, so people can see everybody? I'm exhausted from all this decorating, but doesn't the tree look great? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard work decorating. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You got to say it in the mic. Kenzie wants to know what all these decorations mean. <laughs> okay. Well, they all have a story. What do you think? The ornaments? Well, these ornaments, they symbolize God's blessings in our lives. And we have a lot, don't we? We always have a lot of ornaments on our tree, right? Because we have a lot of blessings from God. Okay? Why do we have lights? Why do we have lights? Hold on. We've got to finish the ornaments first. So when you're hanging your ornaments on the tree, what you need to do is count your blessings. So somebody tell me, what's a blessing that God has given you in your life? Regina? Something that you want. Um, who, what is a blessing? Can somebody name one of their blessings? Kenzie, can you come this way so you're not in the microphone? And let's pull this down so you guys can be heard. Come over here. So tell me a blessing. Do you have any blessings in your life, Megan? Do you have a blessing? Do you have a mom? Is she a blessing today? Yeah. Okay. She's a dad. Do you have a dad? Yes. yes. Is he a blessing? Yes. yes. Anybody think of any other blessings you have? My sister. Your sisters, yes. Oh, Some days they are blessings. Hi. Yeah, there's my Holly. Animal. Hi, Holly. <laughs> my animal. Yeah, and your animals. My okay. Family. Your family, yes. Good job, Adriana. Why do you have that? And, and look, you asked about the lights. Why do we have lights? For the tree. For, they go on the tree, and, and they represent that we are the light of the world, okay? And Jesus wants us to shine our light so people will know about him. Okay, this little girl wants to know about the bells. Paisley wants to know about the bells. Listen to what the bells do. They make a noise. And you know what the shepherds did with bells? What? They would ring them so the sheep would know where they were at, and it would guide the sheep. And so it reminds us that God is is guiding us to Him. Okay. And what? And Kenzie asked about the candy canes. The candy canes are really cool. Hold it up like a, like like that. What's that look like? A candy cane. A shepherd's cane. A shepherd's a cane. cane, yes. And so it reminds us like of the shepherds. And what does it look like now? A J. And what does a J for Jesus? Yes. And then there's stripes on it. What are this the big red like stripes about? This oh, looks like an O. It represents his blood. And what about the white stripe? His purity. And then what about the three tiny stripes that are on there? Jesus was given three stripes. Uh, uh, they represent the stripes, not three, but they represent the stripes that Jesus had on his body by being beaten for us. Well, Kenzie's asking what this holly represents. Well, you see these leaves? These leaves are sharp. And they kind of remind us of the thorns that Jesus had on his head, right? Mm -hmm. And then the red berries that are on it, or orange in this case, they represent Jesus' blood, okay? It's okay, Ethan. Come here. Hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> I can't lift you. you got to come to me. <laughs>
Thank you, Adrina. We have an angel so that so that the people so that we remember about the angels that came on Christmas and told the shepherds about Jesus. They were messengers, yes. Okay, and they told us about Jesus coming. And Brooke, you have a star. What does a star represent? Anybody have an idea? What, what, what did a star do in the Christmas story? I know. Yes, it shone the light to Bethlehem so that Mary, the shepherds, and the wise men could know where to go to find Jesus. We're going to do that. Right? And we put all these things on a tree for something. Do you, want, do you know why we use an evergreen tree? The evergreen tree represents life. Green represents life. And that's what we have in Jesus, right? Yeah. And the needles of a real Christmas tree will point to the sky, to heaven. And the other thing about the Christmas tree is they don't go dormant. That means that they stay alive all year long. They don't lose their leaves. And they stay alive like we do in Jesus, okay? No, they don't die. And I have a couple other things hidden. I have, I have something here. What do you think this is? A present. It's a present. What do presents remind us of at Christmas time? Ethan? Uh, it represents the gifts the three wise men gave to God. And what were those three gifts? Do you remember? Um, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And do you remember why? Gold, because they thought, because they knew that he was a king. Gold, because he was a king. Frankincense. Because we burn. We burn. Incense to God. And myrrh. Do you remember myrrh? I know you remember that one. They used it at a certain time when somebody dies. When somebody dies, they use it. Okay, you're peeking at my gift. This is my gift. Okay, there's one more thing on the table that we haven't talked about. What's the cookie, cookie. represent? Well, I thought I might get hungry up here, so I got myself a cookie. Then why is there a cardboard? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, because I wanted to make sure I remembered to eat my cookie. Oh. Sharing is caring. Sharing is caring. That's right. When we make cookies, they all look the same, kind of. But when God made us, we're all unique and we're all special. Yay. Yes. How about we pray and leave the microphone alone? Those cost a whole bunch of money. Okay? So let's hold hands and pray. We're not going back to the room. We're going to go back and sit with our parents. Okay? Brooke, you want to hold Megan's hand while we pray? Okay, Father, we thank you and praise you that you are the reason that we celebrate right now. And we thank you, Jesus, that you came born as a baby and that you didn't just stay a baby, but you grew and you died on a cross for our sins. We thank you for that. We pray that you'll be with each of us as we celebrate Christmas and that we remember always that you are why we celebrate. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning, one verse from the fourth chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. You've heard me say this over the last couple of weeks, 
Two frightened young parents, a newborn baby, a bed of straw. What if what happened then changes everything now? And you know the answer to that is that it has, and it continues to do that. But sometimes it's easy to forget that the Christmas holiday has anything to do with God's plan to restore himself to man, to restore mankind to himself. If you stand in those long lines at any of the department stores and, and you just listen to the conversation that's going on, sometimes we, we really have to stretch to remember that there is to be joy this time of the year. But the fact is that this holiday is meant to commemorate the most one of the most audacious miracles of all times, the arrival of Jesus, Emmanuel. The Christmas experience shows us that Christ is worth waiting for. His coming into the world may not make our circumstances easier. In fact, like many who experienced the first Christmas, the very opposite may be true. But he does give our lives purpose and true joy. He brings a joy that the world cannot give. The people who lived through this miraculous event of the first Christmas experienced firsthand the impact of Jesus' life. Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, all of them would be forever changed. And that can still happen to you and to I today. Our six-week sermon series has been entitled The Christmas Experience. And today's sermon, This is God's Plan. This is God's plan. And I think there are two ways that we can actually consider those words. First of all, this is God's plan, a statement. For those of us who live on this side of the cross, God's plan of salvation, except for the return of Christ, has been revealed. The prophecies have foretold the coming of Jesus the, the prophets have, have witnessed to the fact that there will come one who will be the Savior of all, and that is Jesus. The prophets shared that the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to the child, and the child will be called the Son of the Most High God, His name, Jesus. But the plan didn't end there. Jesus grew to be a man, and about the 30th year of His life, he began to seek, seek followers to begin a ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, the first sermon that he preached. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, and that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. When you think about those last words, the time of the Lord's favor has come. What the heck did that mean to those who were listening? What does it mean to us today? When Jesus said those words, the crowd became angry. The crowd began to uh, become angry at Jesus and even to the point of violence. They saw, jo they saw Jesus as Joseph's son, and not as the Son of God. They were enraged that, that Jesus claimed to be something that they could not fathom or they could not imagine. The Son of God, the time of the Lord's favor had come. But it had come. It was with them. And this was God's plan. For the people were struggling, for these people were struggling to understand God's plan for the world. And Mary and Joseph, they were in that era of time. We talked about just at the right time. And, and so often, we want God's time to match our time. We want God to, to answer our questions in the next 30, or answer our prayers in the next 30 seconds. And, and so we don't want to have to wait. But sometimes... Sometimes God's answer is to wait. And so, at the right time, the prophets had been silent for over 400 years when Jesus, after, before Jesus was born. And Israel thought that God had left them. 
But at the right time, God revealed to Israel that he was still there. We talked about Mary being the favored one. And she didn't, she didn't mean that in a way where she patted herself on the back or she stood at a podium and, and got a gold, uh, gold medal to wear. It wasn't recognition of what she had done. It was recognition of what God was doing. It was recognizing how God was working through her. We talked about Joseph being the faithful one, not knowing what this plan was about, not knowing how this plan would be revealed. Neither Mary nor Joseph could see this plan in its full uh, entirety, in its entirety, and they didn't know what was going to happen in the next few days or the next few weeks or the next few years. They didn't know that, that uh, they would meet someone in the temple when Jesus was eight days old that would tell them that they, he had been promised to see the Savior before he died. They didn't know how this plan was going to unravel, unveil itself and reveal itself to them and to the world. They faced all kind of struggles. They took a hundred mile journey to get to Bethlehem. Ladies, can you imagine in your ninth month of pregnancy walking or riding a donkey a hundred miles? I don't think there's anyone that said, yeah, I'm up for that. On the other side of that coin, there's Joseph, who was, as, as we understand it, considerably older than Mary. Maybe the donkey was not for Mary. Maybe the donkey was for Joseph to ride. And then when they got to their destination, they slept in the barn. This is God's plan, though. I want to ask you this question. Where have you seen Jesus show up lately in your life? Where have you seen Jesus show up lately? Can I have the next slide? This is the other way you can look at those words. Not as a statement, but as a question. This is God's plan? How many times have you asked yourself that question? Maybe a better question is this. How many times this week have you asked yourself that question? And I think that as logical thinking people, we have a tendency to, to begin to plan out everything in our lives. I only have to give Allie a suggestion. And she will go online and she will research whatever it is that I've talked about. She will research it to the nth degree. She will know the ins and outs of, of uh, whatever it was that we talked about. We were getting ready for vacation, and, and um, normally we take a couple of days for ourselves before we go and spend time at, uh, at the Outer Banks. And, and I said to her, wouldn't it be nice to go to Assateague Island? That's all I said. Within a matter of days, she had, she had a list of, of, um, of hotels that we could stay at. She had a list of events that we could do. There was a list of restaurants that we might want to consider. She had it all laid out. And then she said to me, which one of these do you want to do? And I said, I don't care. Whichever one looks good to you. Whichever one looks good to you. But we have that tendency to want to plan it all out. And whether it be struggles at home or financial problems or addiction or anything else, if, if we begin to think that maybe God is not in something if we don't hear from him right away. I also said a few weeks ago that, that comfort can be a bad thing in our life. If comfort is sought ahead of anything else, including our desire to be available for God's plan. We meet uh, in a covenant group once a month, and uh, we were sitting around the table the other day talking about this life as, as a United Methodist pastor. And somebody said, most people don't realize what it means to be itinerant, and that is 
to, to move whenever you're told to move. Here's what it's like. You put everything you own in a box, everything. Even the things that, you, that you've forgotten that you had, even the things that you don't know how to put in a box, you put in a box. And then one day, some guys come, or women, and, and they pick up all those boxes and they, and they put it in a big truck. And you're left with all the marks in the carpet where the furniture was, all the marks in the carpet that you had forgotten about when you spilled coffee there um, a year and a half ago. Maybe that's just me. You, you find all those things that need to be vacuumed up and cleaned up. And then you get in your car and you go. And you're supposed to leave that all behind. And you come to a new place where you don't know anybody. You don't know the community. You don't know the, the needs. And, and, and you take everything back out of the box. And you marvel at it because you haven't seen it for maybe three or four months. And you begin a new ministry. But in that, the bishop, the cabinet, the, the district superintendents all sit around the table and discuss whose gifts best match the church. And it is, it is in, you know, their, their human decision, but they are guided by God's uh, revelation. And they don't always get it right. Because, you know, in our humanness, we don't always understand completely what God is saying. But, for the most part, in listening to God, they, are, they have revealed God's plan to some new churches. And so this is God's plan. And sometimes, you know, when we, when we get comfortable, we, we don't see what it means to, 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 uh, to have God's plan worked out in, in our lives. And sometimes we have to take that step in faith. There's been a great deal of talk lately about refugees and those seeking asylum in the United States. And I don't want to start a political debate this morning. That's not what I'm sharing this for. But I want to share some things with you that maybe you didn't know. Friendship Park is a half acre binational, that means two nation park, along the United States-Mexican border. It is located within a larger border field state park in San Diego County in California. And the park includes, that park includes part of the park that includes a border fence between the United States and Mexico. A border fence that separates the two countries where people of both countries can meet and see each other through the fence. On the U.S. side, the park used to be part of a, of a Monument Mesa picnic area, but is now wholly located within federal, depart, federal property under the Department of Homeland Security. And it is heavily monitored by U.S. Border Patrols 24 hours a day. The United Methodist Church and the, Mexican, or the Methodist Church of Mexico hold a joint communion service on each side of the fence every Sunday morning. Why? Because it is in the social principles of the United Methodist Church that we recognize, embrace, and affirm people, regardless of country of origin, as members of the family of God. Why? Because we see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so you say, this is God's plan for people to share in communion divided by a fence. And the, the social principles of the United Methodist Church say we urge society to recognize the gifts, the contributions, and struggles of those who are immigrants and to advocate for justice for all. And we can give a hundred reasons on this side why we should build a fence. And we can probably, we can probably justify the same number on this side why we should welcome. And again, I'm not here to start a political debate. I'm just here to recognize that the folks that, that are, are moving north are people created by God. And just, if, just as Mary and Joseph were turned away, this is God's plan in our time and in our church today to welcome and to open our hearts and our doors to let the stranger in. 
So many of us are, are praying for God's will to be accomplished in our church. And I think, I think it is. God has begun to challenge us and many churches around the, around the nation and around the world to step out of their comfort zone and begin to consider things that maybe they hadn't thought about years ago. Think about Mary and Joseph. They, God placed them in a situation where they could find no comfort apart from Him. They needed to seek His presence to find peace when they needed it on that journey. And at just the right time, Jesus was born. Remember, I said at the beginning of my message, God, excuse me, Israel thought God had abandoned them. They hadn't heard from God for a long time. And then in the midst of their lives, God showed up. And I think that's what's happening in our churches today, that God is showing up. It's just my feeling, just my feeling and just my opinion, that I think some of our churches have gotten comfortable. And that is just my opinion. But this is not my opinion. This is, this is what I see, and this is what God reveals, that this is our faith journey together, God showing up and asking us to begin to think outside of ourselves. And I truly believe that, and I will continue to testify to that as long as I live. And you can argue that if you'd like, but there is no other exception, no other explanation on this journey that we could have all taken through this year. God keeps affirming that, and God keeps affirming, and I hope I keep seeing it, that He has called us to a new journey together. Can I have the next slide, please? Sometimes our plan looks like that little four-bedroom bungalow, and God's plan looks like the... Uh, the mansion on the hill. Sometimes God has a plan, and we just stand there and say, there is no way we can afford this. We can take the time. We have the right people. We have enough people. We just, we could find every excuse in the book. And God says, trust me. Trust me. In your faithfulness, my plan will be revealed. And this is not just an isolated incident in one or two churches. I see God calling uh, each of us as, as followers of Jesus to journey in faith. One of my favorite authors is uh, Jim Cimbala. He's the pastor of uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City. And in, in the early 70s, when Pastor Jim was appointed to that church, he, he went there for the first Sunday. There were about 20 people meeting in the basement of the building because the sanctuary, they couldn't afford to heat it anymore. The plaster was coming off the walls, and, and it really wasn't habitable. So they met in the basement. The offering that Sunday was not even enough to cover the electric bill that was due the following day, let alone there was no money in the offering plate to begin to pay his salary. And so Pastor Jim said to the congregation that day, there's only one thing I know to do, and that is we begin to pray together. We begin to pray for God to reveal His plan for us. And whatever that is, we as followers of God will have to be faithful and take that journey. The next day, he was in his office, and, and he, he's trying to make sure that uh, all, the, all the finances can be balanced, and, and it just isn't going to happen. And they need, I don't remember what the, what the amount was, but they needed a specific amount to be able to get through that week. And so he, uh, he went out for a walk to clear his head and to, and to journey with God. And when he came back, somebody had slipped an envelope underneath his office door. And lo and behold, what was in that envelope was the exact amount of money that they needed to continue to fund that church for the next week. So when, when he came up with a bottom line that we need this much money, God had somebody slip that much money under the door in an envelope. 
fast forward 50 years, almost 50 years later. Brooklyn Tabernacle washes, worships about 10,000 people on a weekend. They've, they've bought bigger and bigger buildings to, to be able to um, welcome the number of people that come to worship God there. there is, they have a choir that is over, um, I think it's 200 members, and, and they put out uh, CDs and, and uh, oh boy, I just dated myself. They put out record albums. Um, yeah. But even, even pastors who, who know that, that they need to listen to God and to be faithful to God sometimes get it wrong. And Pastor Jim talks about one Easter Sunday about 20 or 30 years into his ministry. One Easter Sunday where he, he eyes somebody coming down the aisle. It's, it's a, a, a street person, someone who lives on the street in New York City. And Pastor Jim says, the fragrance of this man arrived at me moments before he actually got to me. And when he, when he stood there in front of me, Pastor Jim said, his clothes were stained from whatever it was that he had eaten last night. From, from the time the night before that he had gotten sick and, and he reeked of alcohol and, and um, the fact that he hadn't showered for who knows how many days. And Pastor Jim says, my first thought was, how much money does he want? And he said, I looked at the man and said, how much do you want? And the man said, I want it all. I want it all. I want everything that you just talked about in this worship service. I want Jesus in my life. I want to change my life. I want to begin to listen to what God is saying. And I want to walk this journey. And I want to be a part of this church. I want it all. Pastor Jim said, I just stood there with my head hanging in disgrace because I didn't trust God. I trusted my own feelings, and it was my feelings that thought this man only wanted money, and yet he wanted Jesus himself. So I wonder, excuse me, I wonder what God's plan looks like for us in the future. And I encourage you and I encourage myself and, and us together to begin to think outside of the box and, and to begin to look towards the next year as, and the next years as to what God is, is asking us to do and celebrate whatever that is. I think there's one more slide in testimony. I said the other week that you know, one day we're going we're gonna, to um, invite people to come up here and share a testimony, and that isn't today. But be ready, because I may ask you to share a story of what, what God is doing in your life right now. I may invite you to come and, and share a, a testimony of, of what God is doing. And I would welcome you to, to uh, stop by the office someday and, and just share your own testimony of what God is doing. And let's talk about how God is working in our lives together and what God is doing and what God's plan may look like for the future. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and, and for this time together. We thank you for your love and for your son. And this story about Jesus is your plan. And God, as, as we continue to, to move towards Christmas, help to reveal to us how you are calling us to make Jesus more a part of our lives, to open our lives up for, for you and to, and to get out of maybe the comfort zone that we're in. And God, we just, we just stand in awe of all the things that you're already doing and of all the things that you will do. And Lord, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The cards are pink now. They used to be green, but it's the same card. It's just a different color. And on the back side of the card is a place for your prayer concerns. And I would invite you to put those into the offering plate, and they will show up in next Sunday's bulletins as prayer concerns. 
If you'd like one announced in during worship service, there is a basket that is on the uh, communion rail, and you can you can place these in in that basket prior to worship. And this one came from the basket. Um, Kimball Sterling lost his wife this week. She passed away suddenly. Please remember him in our prayers. This came from the uh, community dinner the other night for my uncle suffering cancer. He's doing okay for now. Thanks. And this one is for Dakota. I love you and I miss you. Stay strong. How often do we want to pray those very words for a friend, a family member, a loved one? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and it's been a busy season. We, <clears throat> we made sure we got all the finishing touches on, on what we're planning for the coming few days. And maybe we haven't gotten all the finishing touches there. But whatever's going to be by Tuesday is going to be. But that's not true in your plan. In, in, in your will, you can see a day when 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 cancer is no longer a, a killer disease. You can see a day when illness no longer overwhelms your people. You can see a day when, when babies no longer suffer and die. You can see a day when all of that is behind humanity. But for today, we pray for those with illness. We pray for healing and strength. We pray for, for peace and for rest for those giving care. And we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. Lord, for the days that you give us strength, we are just overwhelmed. And we thank you. Lord, for the, for the strength that you do give us, we give you praise. When we think we can't get through the next moment or the next minute and we cry out to you, you open those doors for us. When we find ourselves lost and alone, you understand. Jesus revealed that um, his friend Lazarus was going to rise from the dead, but even in that moment before Lazarus came back, there was emotion, there was a tear as Jesus, as Jesus' heart was touched for his friend. And so in our loss and in our loneliness, be here and help us to understand. Help us to see your great plan of, uh, and how it will be revealed. Help us to, to listen for your word and to, to move accordingly. Help us to give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. The ushers are going to come. Please give as God has given to you.
Heavenly Father, we are such a blessed nation with, with riches beyond, beyond so many imaginations. And sometimes we do struggle and sometimes we, we find it hard to make ends meet. But Lord, we just pray that, that you will connect those ends, that you will walk, this, that you will always be with us on this journey. And that we will always recognize that you are here. Father, bless these gifts that have been shared. Use them to build your kingdom, to share the love that you have for, for your world. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Please uh, remain standing if you're able uh, for closing hymn. And this is a little different. We're going to sing this song. We've, we've sung this song before, but we typically don't use the, uh, the spoken responses. And Mike, I made a mistake. We, sing, we say those before the verse. And so these are words that we're going to speak together, and then we'll sing, and we'll do the same thing again. O Emmanuel, our King and lawgiver, the expected of the nations and their Savior, come and save us, O Lord, our God. of Israel, who appeared to Moses in the flames of the bush and gave him the law on Sinai, come with your outstretched arm and redeem us. Come and deliver us. 
us and to tarry not. of Israel, who opens and no one shuts, who shuts and no one opens. Come and bring forth from prison the captive who sits in darkness and in the shadow of death. brightness of the light eternal and the sun of justice. Come and enlighten those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Gentiles and their desired one, cornerstone and makes both one. Come and deliver us to you more than the dust of the earth. is Christmas Eve. We have two celebrations of worship, one at 7, one at 11. Both are candlelight services. Both offer communion. Come and celebrate the birth that we have anticipated. Jesus, one more time, coming again in our lives. Go in peace. <laughs>